everyone, welcome to theCUBE's coverage of AWS Amazon Web Services Global Public Sector Partner Awards Program. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. Here we're going to be talking about the best COVID solution. Our two great guests, Ben Moore with Healthcare and Life Sciences Lead at Palantir. Ben, welcome to theCUBE. Sam Michaels, Director of Automation and Compound Management at NCATS National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. NCATS, part of the NIH, National Institute of Health. Gentlemen, thank you for coming on and, and congratulations on the best COVID solution. Thank you so much, John. So I got I to gotta ask you, the best COVID solution is when can I get the vaccine? How fast, how long is it going to last? But I really appreciate <laughs> you guys coming on. I hope you're vaccinated. I would say, John, that's outside of our hands. I would say if you've not gotten vaccinated, go get vaccinated right now. Have someone stab you in the arm, you know, do not wait and, and go for it. That's not on us, but, okay. but you got that opportunity. Now, now that we have that done, I got to get on a plane and all kinds of hoops I got to jump through. We need better solutions. Anyway, you guys have a great technical, so I want to I dig in all serious aside, but getting aside. Um, you guys have put together a killer solution that really requires a lot of data. Can let's step back and, and talk about first, what was the solution that won the award? Can you guys give a quick second, set the table for what we're talking about? Ben, we'll start with you. So uh, the National COVID Cohort Collaborative is a secure data enclave, um, putting together EHR records from more than 60 different academic medical centers across the country, and they're making it available to researchers to you know, ask many and varied questions um, to try and understand this disease better. Sam, take us through the challenges here. What was going on? What was the hard problem? Obviously everyone had a situation with COVID where people broke through and Cloud obviously drove it. Amazon is part, part of this awards, but you guys were solving something. What was the problem statement that you guys were going after and what happened? I, I think the problem statement is essentially that, you know, the, the, the nation has the electronic health records, but it's very fragmented, right? You know, as Ben is, is highlighted is, there's, there's multiple systems, you know, around the country, you know, thousands of folks that have uh, EHRs, but there's no way from a research perspective to actually have access in any unified location. And so really what we were looking for is, is how can we essentially provide a centralized location to study electronic health records, but in a federated sense, because we recognize that the data exist in other locations. And so we had to figure out for a vast quantity of data, how can we get data from those 60 sites, 60 plus that Ben is referencing from their respective locations and then into one central repository, but also in a common format, because that's another huge aspect of the technical challenge was there's multiple formats for electronic health records. There's different standards, there's different versions. And how do you actually have all of this data harmonized into something which is usable again for research? I mean, just so many things that are jumping in my head right now, I want to unpack one at the time COVID hit, the scramble and the imperative for getting answers quickly was huge. So it's a data problem at a massive scale, public health impact. Again, we were talking before we came on camera, public health records are dirty. They're not clean. A lot of things are weird. I mean, just, just massive amount of weird problems. How did you guys pull it together? Take me through how this gets done. <laughs> what, wh what happened? Take us through the, the, the steps. You just got together and said, let's do this. How does it all happen? Yeah, no, it's a great, and so John, I would say, so part of this started actually several years ago, I explained this when people talk about N3C, is that NCATS has actually established what we like to call, we support a program which is called the Clinical Translation Science Award Program. It's the largest single grant program in all of NIH, and it constitutes the, the bulk of the NCATS budget. So this is extramural grants, which goes all over the country. And, and we wanted this group to essentially have a common research environment. So we try to create what we call these secure scientific collaborative platforms. Um, another example of this is one we call the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network, which again is a consortia of 20 different sites around the nation. And, and so really we had started working on this several years ago that if we want to build an environment that's collaborative for researchers around the country, around the world, the natural place to do that is really with a cloud first strategy. And we recognize this as NCATS, we're about 600 people now, but if you look at the, the size of our actual research community with our grantees, we're in the thousands. And so from the perspective that we took several years ago was we have to really take a step back and if we want to have a, a comprehensive and cohesive package or solution, we have to treat this as really a mid-sized business, you know? And so that means we have to treat this as a cloud-based enterprise. And so NCAT several years ago had really gone on this strategy to, to bring in different commercial partners of which, you know, one of them is Palantir. It actually started with our intramural research program. Um, and obviously very heavy cloud use with AWS. We use Azure, we use Google Workspace, essentially use different cloud tools to enable our collaborative researchers. 
the, the next step is we also had a project. If we want to have an environment, we have to have access. And this is something that we took early steps on years prior that there's no good building environment if people can't get in the front door. So we invested heavily uh, and created an application which we, we call our federated authentication system. We call it unified NCATS auth, is, so we call it UNA for short. And, and this is a, 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 the open source in-house project that we built at NCATS and we want to actually use this for all sorts of implementation acting as the front door to this collaborative environment being one of them. And then also by by really uh, this 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 interest in electronic health records had, had existed prior to the COVID pandemic. And so we had done some prior work via a mixture of internal investments and grants with collaborative partners to really look at what it would take to harmonize this data at scale. And so like you mentioned, COVID hit, it, it, it hit really hard. Everyone was scrambling for answers. And I think we had a bit of these pieces um, in, in play. And then that's, I think when we turned to, to, to Ben and the team at Palantir and we said, we, we have these components, we have these pieces, but we really need something independent that we can stand up quickly to really address some of these problems. One of the biggest one being that data ingestion and the harmonization step. And, and so yeah. I can let Ben really speak to that one. Yeah, Ben, elaborate please, because you're not solving a lot of collaboration problems too, not just the technical problem, but ingestion and harmonization. Ingestion, most people can understand is in the data warehousing or in the data business know that what that means. Take us through harmonization because uh, not, not to put a little bit of shade on this, but most people think about, you know, these kinds of research or nonprofits as a slow moving, you know, standing stuff up as Sam was saying, it takes time You break it down by the time you, you get into things, things are over. This was agile. So take us through yeah. what made it agile because that's not normal. I mean, that's not what you see normally. It's like, hey, we'll see you next year. We'll stand that up uh, you know, at the data center. Yeah, yeah I mean, so as, as uh, Sam described this sort of the question of data interoperability is a really essential problem for working with this kind of data. Um, and I think, you know, we have data coming from more than 60 different sites. And one of the reasons we were able to move quickly was because rather than saying, oh, well, you have to provide the data in a certain format, a certain standard, um, N3C was able to say, actually, just give us the data how you have it in whatever format is easiest for you. And we will take care of that process of actually transforming it into a single standard data model, converting all of the medical vocabularies, um, doing all of the data quality assessment that's needed to ensure that data is actually ready for research. Um, and that was very much a collaborative endeavor. It was um, run out of a, a team based at Johns Hopkins University, um, but in collaboration with a, a broad range of researchers who were all adding their expertise. And what we were able to do was to provide the, uh, the sort of the technical infrastructure for taking the transformation pipelines that are being developed, the, the actual logic and the code, and developing these very robust kind of centralized templates for that um, that could be deployed just like software is deployed, have change management, have upgrades and downgrades and version control and change logs uh, so that we can roll that out across a large number of sites in a very robust way uh, very quickly. So that sort of that that that's one aspect of it, and then there was a, a bunch of really interesting challenges along the way that, um, again, a very broad collaborative team of researchers worked on. And an example of that would be unit harmonization and, and inference. So really simple things like when a lab result arrives, we talked about data quality. Um, you would expect it to have a unit, right? Like if you're reporting somebody's weight, you probably want to know if it's in kilograms or if it's in pounds but we found that a, a very significant proportion of the time, the unit was actually missing in the EHR record. And so unless you can actually get that back, that becomes useless. And so uh, an approach was developed because we had data across 60 or more different sites, you have a large number of lab tests that do have the correct units. And you can look at the data distributions and decide how likely is it that this you know, missing unit is actually kilograms or, or pounds. And, and save a huge portion of these labs. So, you know, that's just an example of something that has enabled research to happen that would not otherwise have been able so to, just, to happen. Uh, not, not to dig in and rat hole on that one point, but what time saving do you think that saves? I mean, I can imagine just on the data cleaning side, that's just a massive time saving, just to infer, okay, based on the data sampling, this is kilograms or, or pounds. Just exactly, I mean, so we're talking, there's more than three and a half billion lab records in this data base now. So if you were trying to do this manually, no I way. mean, it would take it would take you thousands of years, yeah. you know? So it's, it just wouldn't be possible. It would be a you black, hole. Be a black hole in the data set. 
essentially, yeah, I, because there's no way it would get done. Okay, okay, Sam, take me through like from a research standpoint, this, this normalization, harmonization, the process, what does that enable for the, um, for the research and who decides what's the standard format? So, cause again, I'm just in my mind thinking how hard this is and then what was, the, what was decided? Was it just on, on the base records? Who, what standards were happening? What's the impact of researchers? No, it's a great question. Well, a couple of things I'll say, and Ben has touched on this, is the other real core piece of N3C is the community, right? You know, and so I think there's a couple of things you mentioned with this, John, is the way we execute this is, it was very nimble, it was very agile, and there's something to be said on that piece. From a procurement perspective, the government had many COVID authorities that were granted to make very fast decisions to get things procured quickly. And we were able to turn this around with our acquisition shop, which we would otherwise you know, be dead in the water, like you said, wait a year, go through a normal yeah, uh, acquisition true. process, which can take time. But, but that's only one half. The other half, and really you're touching on this, and Ben is touching on this, is when he mentions the research, is we have this entire cohort, this entire you know, research community numbering in the thousands from a volunteer perspective. And I think it's really fascinating. This is a really a, a great example to me of sort of this public private partnership between the companies we use, but also the academic and, and participants that are actually make up the community. Um, uh, again, who the amount of time they have dedicated on this is just incredible. So, so really what's also been established with this is core governance. And so, you know, as you think from a systems perspective is, you know, the Palantir, this environment, the N3C environment belongs to the government, yeah. but the N33, the the entire actually you know program, I would say, belongs to the community, and we have co-governance on this. So who decides really is just a mixture between the folks on NCAS, but not just NCAS, there's folks at NCAS, folks at you know NIH proper, but also uh, folks at other government agencies, but also the the academic communities and the entire these mixed governance teams that actually set the stage for all of this. And again, you know, who's going to decide the standard? We decide we're going to do this in, in OMOP 5.3.1. Um, is the standard we're going to utilize. And then once the data is there, this is what gets exciting is, is then they have the different domain teams where they can ask different research questions depending upon what has interest scientifically to them. Um, and, and so really, you know, we viewed this from the government's perspective is how do we build again, the secure platform where we can enable the research, but we don't really want to dictate the research. I mean, the one criteria we did put is your research has to be COVID focused, right? Because very clearly in response to COVID. So you have to have, a COVID focus, and then we have data use agreements, uh, data use requests. You know, we have entire governance committees that decide is this research in scope, but we don't want to dictate the research types that the the domain teams are bringing to the table. Yeah, I and mean, I think the National Institutes of Health. You think about just that their mission is to serve the public health, and I think this is a great example of when you enable data to be surfaced and available, that you can really allow people to be empowered and not to uh, use the cliche citizen analyst, but in a way, this is what the community is doing. You're doing research and allowing people from volunteers to academics to students to just be part of it. That is citizen uh, analysis. That's, you, know, you got citizen journalism, you got citizen and, um, research. You got a lot of democratization happening here. Is that part of it or is that a result of this? I, it, 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 it's both, it's a great question. I think it's both and it's, it's really by design because again, we want to enable and there's a couple of things that I really, you know, we, we, we clamor with at, at NCATS. I think NIH is going with this direction too is we believe firmly in open science. We believe firmly in open standards and how we can actually enable these standards to promote this open science because it's actually non-trivial. We've had, you know, the citizen scientists actually on the tricky problem from a governance perspective, or we had the case where we actually had to have students that wanted access to the environment. Well, we actually had to have someone because, you know, they have to have an institution that they come in with, but we've actually, you know, crossed some of those bridges to actually get students and researchers into this environment, very much by design, but also the spirit, which was helped enable by the community, which again, so I think they go, they go hand in hand. We, yeah, we, I think we open, planned for it. Yeah, open science is a, is a huge wave. I'm a big fan. I think that's got a lot of headroom because if you look at open source, what that's done to software, the software industry is amazing. And I think your federated, idea comes in here. And Ben, if you guys could just talk through the, the federated ID, because I think that might enable and remove some of those structural blockers that might be out there in terms of, oh, you got to be affiliated with this or that, or a friend's got to invite you. But then you got privacy access and this federated ID. Not an easy thing, it's easy to say, but how do you tie that together? Because you want to enable frictionless ability to come in and contribute. Same time, you want to have some policies around who's in and who's not. Yes, totally. I, I mean, so Sam sort of already described the 
the UNA system, which is the authentication system that, that NCATS has, has developed. Uh, and obviously, you know, from our perspective, um, you know, we integrate with that. It's using all of the standard kind of authentication protocols, and it's very easy to integrate that into the, the Foundry platform um, and make it so that we can authenticate people correctly. But then if you go beyond authentication, you also then to actually, you need to have the access controls in place to say, yes, I know who this person is, but now what should they actually be able to, to see? Um, and I think one of the really great things N3C has done is to be very rigorous about that. They have their governance rules that says you should be using the data for a certain purpose. You know, you must go through a procedure so that the access committee approves that purpose. And then we need to make sure that you're actually doing the work that you said you were going to. And so before you can get your data back out of the system or your results out, you actually have to prove that those results are in line with the original stated purpose. And the infrastructure around that and having the access controls and the governance processes all working together in a seamless way so that it doesn't, as you say, increase the friction on the researcher and they can get access to the data for that appropriate purpose. That was a big component of, of, of what we've been building out with, with N3C. Absolutely, and, and really in line, John, with what NIH is doing with the research all service, they call this RAS, and I think things that we believe in and their standards that we're starting to follow and work with them closely, you know, multi-factor authentication because of the point Ben is making and you raised as well, you know, one, you need to authenticate, okay, this, you are who you say you are, and, and we're recognizing that, and, and you're, you know, the auth end piece, but then the auth Z, what are you authorized to see? What do you have authorization to? And, and they go hand in hand, and again, non-trivial problems, and especially, you know, when we, we base this, uh, typically a lot of what we're using is, is we'll do direct uh, integrations with our UNA package, we use in commons for federated access. We're also even using login.gov. Um, you know, again, because we needed to make sure that people had a means, you know, and login.gov is essentially a runoff, right? If they don't have, a, you know, an organization which we have in commons or a federated access to generate a login.gov account, but they still are whole, you know, beholden to the, the multi-factor authentication step. And then they still have to get the same authorizations because we really do believe, you know, access to these environments seamlessly is absolutely critical. You know, know who our users are, but again, not make it restrictive and not make it this, this friction, you know, filled process that's very, that's very difficult. Yeah, I mean, you think about non-trivial, totally agree with you. And if you think about like, if you were in a classic enterprise, I thought about an IT problem, you know, like, you know, yeah. bring your own device to work. I and mean, that's basically what the whole world does these days. So like you're thinking about access, you don't know who's coming in, you don't know where they're coming in from. Um, when, and the churn is so high, you don't know, I mean, all this is happening, right? So you have to be prepared to provision and have provide resource to a very yeah. lightweight access edge. That's right, and that's why it gets back to what we mentioned is we were taking a step back and thinking about this problem, you know, when M3C became the use case was this is an enterprise IT problem, right? You know, we have users from around the world that want to access this environment. And again, we try to hit a really difficult mark, which is secure, but collaborative, right? That's that's not easy, you know, but, but again, the only place this environment could take place is in a cloud-based environment, right? That's, let's be real, you know, 10 years ago, for, forget it. You know, again, it may be 10, it, it would have been difficult, but now it's just incredible how much they've advanced that these real virtual research organizations can start to exist and they've become these real partnerships. Well, I want to, well, that's a great point I, I want to highlight and call out because I've done a lot of these interviews with awards programs over the years and certainly in public sector and open source uh, over many, many years. One of the things open source allows is the code reuse. And mm -hmm. also when you start getting in these situations where, okay, you have a crisis, COVID, other uh, things happen. Nonprofits go the same, same thing. They, they lose their funding and all the code disappears. Same with these COVID, when it becomes over, you don't want to lose the momentum. So this whole idea of reuse, this platformization, the platforming of uh, and refactoring, if you will, these are two concepts where the cloud enables. Uh, Sam, I'd love to get your thoughts on this because it doesn't go away when COVID's over. Research uh, not, still not, continues. So this whole idea of replatforming and then refactoring is very much a new concept versus the old days of, okay, project's over, move on to the next one. No, you're absolutely right. And I think what first drove us is we were taking a step back at NCATS, you know, how do we ensure that sustainability, right? Because my background's actually engineering. So I think about, you know, you want to build things to last. And what you just described, John, is that, you know, that, that funding, it peaks, it goes up and then it wanes away and it goes. And what you're left with essentially is, is nothing, right? You know, it's okay, you did this investment, you did a body of work and it goes away. A and really, I think what we're really building are these sustainable platforms that we will actually grow and evolve based upon the research needs over time. And I think that was really a huge investment that both, you know, again, NCATS has made, 
but NIH is going in a very similar direction. You know, there's, there's a substantial investment, um, you know, made in these 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 really impressive environments. How do we make sure they're sustainable for the long term? You know, again, we just went through this with COVID, but what's going to come next? You know, what are the research questions that we need to, to answer? But also, open source is an incredibly important piece of this. I think Ben can speak to this in a second. All the harmonization work, all that effort, you know, essentially this massive complex ETL process is in the N3C GitHub. So we believe, you know, completely in, in the open source model. A little bit of a flavor on it too, though, because, you know, again, back to the sustainability, John, I believe, you know, there's a room for this, this marriage between commercial platforms and open source software. And we need both, you know, yeah. as we're strong proponents of NCATs of both, but especially with sustainability, especially when I think enterprise IT, you know, you have to have professional grade products. That was part of, I would say, an experiment we ran at NCATS. You know, our thought was we can fund academic groups and we can have them do open source projects and, and you'll get some decent results. But I think the nature of IT and the nature of these environments become so complex, the experiment we're taking is we're gonna provide commercial grade tools to the academic community and the researchers and let them use them and see how they can be enabled and actually focus on research questions. And I think, you know, N3C would show we've been very successful with that model while still really adhering to the open source spirit and principles. Well, it's an amazing story, congratulations. And you know what, that's so awesome because that's the future and I think you're onto something huge. Uh, great point, Ben, you want to chime in on this whole sustainability because the public-private partnership idea is the now the new model. Innovation formula is about open, and collaborative. What's your thoughts? Uh, absolutely, and I mean, we uh, you know, at Palantir have been huge proponents of, of reproducibility and openness um, in, in analyses and in, in, in science. And so everything done within the Foundry platform is done in open source languages like Python and R and SQL, um, and is exposed via open APIs and through uh, you know, Git repositories. So that as Sam says, we've, we've pushed all of that ETL code that was developed um, within the platform out to the, the NCATS GitHub um, and the analysis code itself um, being written in those various different languages can also sort of easily be pulled out um, and made available for, for other researchers um, in the future. Uh, and I think what we've also seen is that um, within the, the data enclave, there's been an enormous amount of reuse um, across the different research uh, projects. Uh, and so actually having that security in place uh, and making it secure so that people can actually start to share with each other securely as well and 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 be um very clear that although i'm sharing this it's still within uh, the uh, the range of the government's um, requirements um has meant that the the research has really been accelerated because people have been able to build and stand on the shoulders of what earlier uh, projects have done okay ben great stuff thousand researchers open source code on github where do i sign up i want to get involved this is amazing like it sounds oh, like a great party we'll send you a link yeah if, if you do a search on, on on n3c you know do do a search on that and you'll actually it'll come up with a website hosted by the academic side and it'll show you all the information of how you can actually yeah. connect and and john you're welcome to come in you know billions, I mean, by all means billions of rows of data being solved great tech he's working on again this is a great example of large scale the modern era of solving problems is here it's out in the open open science sam congratulations on your great success ben award winners you guys doing a great job great story thanks for sharing it here with us in the queue appreciate it thank you john thanks for having us okay it is global public sector partner awards best covid solution palantir and ncats great solution uh, great story I'm John Furrier with theCUBE, thanks for watching.